This morning we are in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. If you would turn with me, please. Ephesians, chapter 3. And when you have found it, why don't you just shout, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, that sounds like most of the church is there. It shouldn't be hard to find Ephesians. This is a letter written to the church at Ephesus by Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. As you may know, Paul underwent quite a lot of tribulation during the course of his ministry. When he encountered Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, Jesus said to Ananias that this man, Paul, will see how much he must go through because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul went through quite a lot. Having undergone much tribulation during the course of his ministry, he was now incarcerated in Rome, in a Roman jail. And here he was awaiting trial for no other reason other than that of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Before we go into the text, let me let us understand that the Bible says that all who are in Christ will suffer persecution. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is always a price to be paid. Why? Primarily because it is the power of God unto salvation to as many as would believe. You cannot... You cannot be saved from damnation by any other means other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? That God left heaven, came to earth, went to Calvary, paid the price for sin, was dead, buried, and rose from the dead. And it's the only means by which one can have eternal life the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Satan knows this. So he would always challenge it. Not just the preachers of the word, but every child of God will be challenged. Your salvation will be challenged. Your walk with God will be challenged. Your obedience to Christ will be challenged. Every aspect of our lives will be challenged, primarily because of this gospel of Jesus Christ. In spite of his tribulations, Paul never let it deter him from preaching. He said it in in the word. He says, woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Christ. And so here he was yet for another time sitting in a jail, writing this letter to the church at Ephesus, which he had found. If we were to, before going into the text, if we were to take a brief look at how he commenced this writing in chapter 1, verse 1, we would see that the letter was not exclusively for the church at Ephesus. And it's important that we understand that. He wrote the letter to the church at Ephesus and all the faithful in Christ Jesus. This includes every born-again believer that ever lived, is living, and will ever live. And in this letter, there is a text, there is a prayer that Paul prayed. And because all scripture is given by inspiration of God, And the letter was written to all believers. The prayer that we are going to look at this morning is a prayer 
that is good for you today, good for me today, and for every believer that would ever live. It has been inspired by the Spirit of God. And I may say this to you later on if I remember, but just so that I don't forget, it's a prayer that we should all be praying each time we go to seek the face of the Lord. It's a prayer that we should be praying for ourselves. It's a prayer that we should be praying for each other. Each time we go into devotion with the Lord, we should pray this prayer. It is a prayer that is the will of God for our lives. It expresses the will of God for our lives. Let's look at the prayer, chapter 3, reading from verse 13. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. This is Paul. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you, this is the prayer, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. This is the prayer that we should all be praying. And then he concludes with the doxology. Now unto him, that's Jesus Christ, that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church of Christ Jesus throughout all ages. And would the saints of God say, Amen. The first thing we want to look at in verse 15, whilst it has no bearing on the message per se, the, rather the bearing on the, the prayer per se, I want us to take a look at it carefully. First, we see that Paul acknowledges, this is verse 15, he acknowledges that all saints, whether in heaven or on earth, as forming one family that is named after God. Now, let's listen again. He's acknowledging that all saints, whether in heaven Listen to me carefully. Whether in heaven or on earth, as forming one family that is named after God. Why am I telling you this this morning? It is a belief. And it's perpetrated by a big religious organization that when... A child of God dies, the child of God goes into a soul sleep. You're just totally unconscious. And you go into the grave and you remain there until the Lord Jesus Christ will come for his church. Then you will be resurrected. What in effect that means is that when you 
and I die, we are not going to see the face of God for a long, long time until Jesus comes. It means that all the saints that have died before are still in the grave. In this state of soul sleep, not knowing anything, totally unconscious. And would only be conscious when Jesus Christ comes to read. Isn't that a hard bit to swallow? To know that we're not going to be with the Lord? I just can't buy into that. Because that's not what my word says. God says, through Paul, who had the experience of going to heaven, meeting with the Lord, and having revelations so that he writes more, more than two-thirds of the New Testament, he says to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. With the Lord. I said from, present from. <laughs> To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I wanted to make it abundantly clear to us this morning that we need to be very careful, especially those of us who turn on our televisions while we're dressing to come to church. And there is this organization that talks only about Saturday, that is the recognized Sabbath day. They're the ones that preach this nonsense. Listen to what Paul says in verse 15. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. What family is that? It has to be every child of God who have, been, who have died. They are now presently... Presently, even as we speak, they are presently in heaven. There is no question of lying in a grave and sleeping until Jesus comes, unconscious. Absolutely no question. We have got a family already in heaven. So we can safely say this morning, hello to our family in heaven. And when we leave this earth... That's exactly where we are going. We do not have to go past go. We do not have to collect anything. <laughs> to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I thought I would make that very clear because the question keeps coming up all the time in this church. New people coming to the church, they don't understand what is happening after death. But I have done it so many times, I thought I would just throw this in here this morning. So, having clarified that, if you were wondering about it, let's go on now to the text. Paul's prayer was that God will grant you that he would grant me and all living saints according to the riches of his glory. What did he mean by that? Simply put, it means according to the abundance of his love, according to the abundance of his mercy, according to the abundance of his grace, and the abundance of his faithfulness. How many of you know that the Lord Jesus Christ loves us abundantly. That his mercy for us is abundant. That there's an abundance of grace that surrounds us and abounds us as children of God. And that his faithfulness to us, it abounds for all of eternity. This is the Lord that we serve. And Paul is praying that through this abundance that we will be strengthened through this abundance, we will be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. 
rather than for us, and I glad, I'm so glad we sang that song last, rather than seeking his face, his hands. Let's seek his face. Let's continue to pray this prayer that we would be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Why is this necessary? We will come to that in a while. But this was not just a strengthening of the body by some physical means. No, it was not just a matter of exercising your body to have it strengthened or eating the right food so that your body would be strengthened. Not that anything is wrong with that. He was not talking about strengthening the physical body. This was not just strengthening the mind by some mental exercise. What he was speaking about here was for a divine strengthening with might. Underscore that in your Bible. With might by the Holy Spirit in the inner man. In other words, he was praying that the Holy Spirit within the spirit of the believer would strengthen with might the spirit of the believer. So this goes beyond just accepting the Lord as Savior Coming to church, doing some works for the Lord, and remaining in the same spiritual position all the time. This goes beyond that. And I dare say this morning that we must understand that God is always calling us up hither. He never intends for us to get on a plateau, level there, settle there in a comfort zone and remain there for the rest of our lives. Paul was an advocate of that. He says that not that he had attained, but this one thing I do, I press, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ, of God in Christ Jesus. He was never satisfied with where he was. And not one of us, no child of God, should ever be satisfied with our spiritual position. We should always be striving to get up higher, to move on further. And this is what Paul was praying about here. That we would be strengthened with might by the Holy Spirit in the inner man. That word might in the Greek, according to Strong's, is dunamis, and it means miraculous power. Now, we know that we have got the Holy Spirit of God in us. We know that we have got the power of God in us. But we are talking about being strengthened with might by the Spirit in our spirits. As I said before, it goes beyond where we would normally be by just accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and moving along in our comfort zone. To have the inner man strengthened by the Spirit, listen to me. To have the inner man strengthened by the Spirit is to have our feelings, our thoughts, and purposes placed more and more under the influence of the Spirit of God. I'm going to go slowly. This is so important. To have the inner man strengthened by the Spirit is to have our feelings, our thoughts, and purposes placed more and more under his influence and direction so that the Spirit can manifest his power through us in a greater way. So that the Spirit can manifest his power through us in a greater way. We have got a power within us. The question is, can the Spirit of God manifest that power through us 
in a greater way than he does or he is doing, can he do that? Well, when we get down to the end of the message, we will see why it is important that we allow him to do so. More than anyone else, Paul understood how necessary that kind of strengthening was for us. Because even as children of God, we would all go through trying times in many, many different ways. There will be persecutions from the unredeemed world. There will be temptations, both of one's own flesh and by the powers of darkness. There will be hurts, there will be disappointments, there will be betrayals, there will be mental and emotional pains. The fact that we are children of God does not mean that we are not going to experience these things. There's going to be agonizing griefs and heartbreaks. Why? Because life is not always going to be a bed of roses. And the sooner we come to terms with the fact, it's the less we are going to be surprised when things untoward happen to us. We have to understand that life is not going to be a bed of roses in Christ or out of Christ. And even if it appears, or even if we desire it to be a bed of roses, we must understand that roses grow on thorny bramble. <laughs> in other words, they're going to have some picker <laughs> in life. Yes, and you know what thorns do. Apart from personal trials, as children of God, we have to live in a world where evil is called good and good is called evil. So that when we make a stand for that which is right, it can land us into a disadvantageous position. We cannot go along with the world. We have been separated from the world. We have been called apart from the world. We can't go along because the president of the United States of America say a boy and a boy could get married. That makes it right. No, it's wrong. Regardless of who he is. It is not what he says. It is what God says. And the time is going to come as a matter of fact. It is already here in the United States where the church is being persecuted. They cannot get up on a pulpit and say what I have just said to you. They can't. Praise God, I could. But we don't know how long that would last. The time is coming when we are going to have to keep quiet about what is wrong, otherwise we find ourselves in trouble. So what I am saying here is that persecutions will come apart from personal trials. And we are going to have to face a tribulation after tribulation after tribulation. The world is not getting better. It is getting worse. Let us prepare ourselves from now. And you will understand why Paul is praying that we be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man. If we are going to have to make a stand for Christ, for what is right one day, we are going to need more than what we have right now. Because what we have right now, it's easy to put our heads as the proverbial ostrich in a hole and pretend nobody is seeing us. But the time is coming when we're going to have to make a stand and say what is right and what is wrong and make up our minds for the persecution that will come our way. Amen. 
we saw in verse 13 that Paul was desiring that the church at Ephesus faint not at his tribulation. And he declared that it was for this purpose that he prayed to the Father that we be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. The purpose of the strengthening being that as children of God, having to face tribulations at times in our lives, as he had to do, that we too will not faint. In other words, we will not become discouraged and lose faith. We will not become discouraged because of the persecution, because of the tribulations and the trials that we are having to face. We will not become discouraged and lose faith. This is the number one reason why many backslide and give up on God. Because they are discouraged. And the church has a big part to play in this discouragement. Because the church is promising all kinds of things to the people of God. Using the promises of God. Promising the people that they are entitled to everything that God says without telling them that in order to obtain these promises, they have got to keep the conditions. They leave that part out. So that when there is this great expectancy and this fervor and this hype, and after a while nothing is coming, because it's not going to come through hype. God's promises to us are not going to be kept because of hype. His promises are yea and amen. There's no disputing of it. But there are conditions to be fulfilled so that the promises can be kept. I have said this before. I'll say it again and again to you again. God is not obligated to keep his promises if we are not faithful to keep the conditions. If you, I will. That is the basis of some of the promises of this word. One of the devices of Satan is to use discouragement to cause the people of God to backslide. Now, backsliding doesn't necessarily mean that you leave the church and you've gone back into the world. It means that too. But we could backslide right where we are sitting. We have backslidden preachers behind the pulpit preaching the word of God but they are backslidden. So, what I'm saying to you is that because of discouragement, people lose the faith, and it is the number one reason why people backslide. It is the one device that the devil will use that we must not be ignorant of. When thoughts of God not being able to help you are planted in your mind, you ever had that thought? You're going through a situation. It's painful. It's hurting you. It's causing you no end of trouble. You're crying out to God. God seems far away. He's not hearing you. And there comes this thought in your mind. God can't help you. Is there such thing as God cannot do? There is absolutely nothing that God cannot do. But it doesn't mean that he will do everything for us. It does not mean that at all. So that when God is not doing, the devil takes advantage of that situation and causes all kinds of thoughts to be planted in our mind that God is not able to help us. When it seems God is not answering a prayer, it's a source of discouragement. When the more you pray, the situation seems to get worse. Have you ever had that experience? 
the more you pray, the situation gets worse. Well, if we look at that from a natural perspective, that is something to be very, very concerned about. But from a God perspective, we could know, we can know that what appears to be worse means that it is actually getting better. Because it is from a God perspective. We only have to think in terms of Joseph and his brothers. Everything that happened to Joseph, it kept getting worse and worse and worse. But God had a plan to bring Joseph into a place that he would have him be to make him the prime minister of Egypt. But he had to go through these evil times so that God's purpose could be accomplished. God perspective. When heaven seems cold and hard as brass and God seems nowhere around, it is the might of this divine strength by the Spirit of God in us that is needed to keep us in the hour of overwhelming trials, distresses, misfortunes, and temptations. I'm beginning to show you how important it is, this prayer, and why it was prayed not just for the saints at Ephesus, but to all believers. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 1. To all believers. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So that we do not become discouraged at times like these. Being inspired by the Spirit of God, he continues to pray in verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. What kind of prayer is that to believers? That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love... Evidently, as Christians, like ourselves, the believers at Ephesus, they all had the indwelling Holy Spirit. So what is it that Paul is praying about that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith? Christ is in our hearts. He dwells there. So why the prayer that that be happening, that that, that should happen? The expression here is that Christ may establish his presence in our hearts so that no matter what we may be going through or how things may seem or how we may feel, come what may, we will not be shaken. Our faith in Christ would be sustained. This is what it means. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Whenever we go through some serious trying times, it's a time that we feel that Christ stops dwelling in our heart. He gone. Because our faith, our faith, is being tested. Our faith is being tried. And we need to understand why it is Paul prayed this prayer. You see, he had the living experience. He had to go through tribulation after tribulation after tribulation after tribulation. He was stoned and left for death. He was dead. He was beaten with many stripes. He was almost drowned in the sea. He was there day and night. He has a long record. And he understood how necessary it is to have this kind of faith that no matter what comes our way, we must know that Christ is there for us. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you always, even unto the ends of the world. 
So it doesn't matter how it may feel. It should not matter how it may seem. Yes, it's not nice to be praying and heaven seems like as cold as brass and hard as brass. It's not a nice feeling. But we move by faith, not by feeling. And in spite of what is happening or how it seems not to be happening, contrary to how we are praying, we must know that we know that we know that we know that Christ is in us. And that is our hope of glory. And if he is in us, he will, she says, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. So if we are going down, he's going down with us. And it's no big thing if Christ goes down with us because he has proven that he can rise again. It's important that we know this. And this is why Paul prayed this prayer that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That was not all. He says that you be rooted, that you be rooted and grounded in love, that you be rooted and grounded in love. So here he is using two imageries to emphasize the point. The imagery of a tree, and I believe it would be like the oak tree, that great old oak. And he's using the imagery of a building. Why? He prays that we be rooted as the great oak is rooted with its roots going deep, going deep and entwining the rock bed so that no matter how strong the storm winds may blow, it will stand majestically strong and will not be blown over. This is what he means that you be rooted in Christ's love, like an oak tree. The oak tree has the kind of roots that nothing stops it. If it can't get around a rock, it will get under the rock. If it get, can't get under the rock, it will get over the rock. And if it can't get around, under, over, it's going through the rock. That's the kind of root that that tree has. That's why no matter how strong the winds may blow, every tree may fall over. Even the coconut trees will fall over. But the oak stands majestically strong. And this is his prayer. This was Paul's prayer for us. It is God's will for us. And it should be the prayer that we pray continually for ourselves and one for another. His prayer is that we be grounded. As a building is grounded, how is a building grounded? By its foundations. The foundation is what holds the building. You take a building and you scratch the ground and you start building like you're crazy. Well, somebody might come and huff and puff and blow your house down. But when you dig, when you dig and you lay those foundations, you know, I have noticed many buildings, especially in the United States. So you're driving through New York and you see they're going to put up a big story building. Years will pass and you see the thing fenced around like nothing is going on. If you get a little peephole and you peep, you'll see a lot of work going down. Dig in, dig in, because they're putting down a foundation to hold a large building. You don't see what is happening, but it's underground. 
and what is on the ground will hold up what is above the ground. And this is why Paul says that we be rooted, not just rooted, but we would be grounded. We will be grounded in love. What love is this? A love that is steadfast, unshakable, unmovable, anchored on a solid foundation. What love is that? The love of God for you. We must be rooted and grounded in that kind of love. We must know that he loves us. Too often we can question his love when we are going through times of tribulation in our lives. But we ought not to question his love. We just look back at Calvary. What did he say? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man will lay down his life for his friend. He calls us friends. God who created the heavens and the earth. God who had no beginning, who was before the beginning, who created the beginning. Eternity to eternity can't hold God. And this God calls us his friend? Considering that we were once wretches, now we are friends of God? That is love. Paul wants us to be rooted and grounded in his love. A love that is steadfast, unshakable, unmovable, anchored in a solid foundation so that we can safely say like Paul, who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Who? What could separate us? What could separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation, he asked the question. He says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, these things could separate us from the love of God? He says, no, at all. He's persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And he's praying that we be rooted and grounded in this love. Now, we have to understand that love is a two-way thing. It's not a one-way thing. And God has called us to love him. He has called us to love him. So this love that we are talking about is not just a love from God to ourselves, but a love from ourselves to God. We have got to be rooted and grounded in love for God. We have to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. We have to be rooted and grounded in love for God. Situations and circumstances should not change our love for God because situations and circumstances will not and cannot change His love for us. So that no matter what we may be going through, we need to be steadfast in our love for him. How do we show our love for God? He says it. If you love me, you will keep my commands. He doesn't ask for anything big, you know. He never says, if you love me, prove it, lie down in bed with me. No, if you love me, you will keep 
my commands. I see some of you smiling. You know, well, we used to want people to prove their love long time, huh? Yeah, so stupid. <laughs> and he continues with the prayer. That we will be able, verse 18, that we will be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now here is a little problem. He wants us to know something that is unknowable. He wants us to know something that is unknowable. Do you see that here? That we may know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. How could you know something that passes knowledge? Well, in other words, that we may be able to comprehend with our minds, <laughs> no, our minds are limited, that we will be able to comprehend with our minds having a continuous conscious thought and experience in our lives the limitless love of Christ for us. You see, it is limitless. That's why it passes knowledge. But we must know that it never fails. <laughs> we must know that it is limitless. Remember we started off talking about Paul going through tribulations and praying for the church that they would not be discouraged as a result of his tribulations. Remember I said that we too, like him, will have to go through tribulations and it was for this purpose he was praying that we be strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man so that when we have to go through these tribulations, our faith will not fail us. You see, it, the prayer follows. It flows. When we read it, it seems disjointed. But it's a flowing prayer. And it's so absolutely necessary. So it is having a con con continuous conscious thought in our mind. We must keep it uppermost in our minds. Your mind is the battlefield of the devil. That's where he's going to put doubt. That's where he's going to put fears. That's where he's going to put worry. That's where he's going to put all kinds of confusion. But we must be continuously conscious of this fact of Christ's love for us. This is what he means by Christ dwelling dwelling, nothing must move the fact of God's love for you when you're going through situations that are negative in your life. Nothing must move that conscious thought so that if we have this conscious thought, we would be able to say, if God be for us, who can be against us? We can be able to appropriate the word of God. No weapon that's formed against me will prosper. And all who talk bad against me, I would be able to condemn those tongues. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We must be conscious of Christ dwelling in us. We are Christlets. Young Christ. That is if we are allowing his life to flow through us. Not if we're just calling ourselves chrysalis. So this must always be a continuous, 
conscious thought in our minds and in our hearts that God's love for us has no limit. It's beyond our knowledge. It's beyond our understanding. It has no limits. It has no boundaries. There is nowhere in the universe that Christ's love cannot reach us. David says it. He says, if I make my bed in hell, he is there. If I ascend to the heavens, he is there. There is no way, nowhere can you go away from the love of Christ. You just can't. There is no sinner that his love cannot save. No sinner. You hear our brother Glenn Roy stand here and talk about his life. Oh, he was a big sinner. <laughs> now he's a big preacher. <laughs> and I refuse to be overdone. <laughs> I was a big sinner. And I'm a preacher. God's love has no limit. It has no boundaries. There's nothing can separate us from the love of God. So there is no sinner that his love cannot save and no sin that cannot be forgiven. Listen. Too often I hear about children of God not wanting to go to God and ask for forgiveness because they're ashamed of their sin. Some pull out of the church and run away because they fell into sin. Listen, the church is for sinners. Jesus said, I have not come to save the righteous, but to sinners. This is the place for sinners. And it's the place where when sinners come, they would learn that through Christ they have the power to overcome sin. So there is no need to continue in sin. But if perchance you sin, you have an advocate with God the Father. That if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. This is not a license to sin. This is an assurance of God's love, His faithfulness, His grace, and His mercy. So instead of running from Him, you run to Him with the full assurance that I have sinned. I ask your forgiveness. You wash me by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that's not the end of the sin thing because what must follow is repentance, which means you're not going back into the sin. You're turning away from the sin. That is what makes confession effective. Amen. Repentance. So we're talking about the love of Christ. That Christ may dwell in you. How, how, how did he say it? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend what is the breath and length and depth and height of his love for us. The breadth and length and depth and height of his love is from eternity to eternity. It's easy to comprehend that, isn't it? Don't try to measure it. Don't try to measure it. Just comprehend it. It's as high as eternity is from eternity, as deep as eternity is from eternity, as wide as eternity is from eternity. Such is his love for us. It 
surpasses all knowledge. So Paul's prayer is that we may be able to have a continuous con conscious thought of that love of Christ in us, that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. As I said before, that God's presence may so fill us that in any given situation, whether negative or positive, we reflect and we manifest our innermost being, the character. We must manifest the character and stature which belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he means that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Christ may dwell in your hearts. If he is dwelling in your hearts, people should be able to see him. Hello. If he is indeed dwelling in our hearts, people should be able to see him. Not in our hearts, but his life living through us. So that we must become the living epistles that others will see and read. Unfortunately, it's not like that in Christendom. But this is what it's all about, to get us to that place. With this prayer that has been prayed, that is continually being prayed on our behalf, if we continue praying for ourselves like this, we will get there, believe me. Now, as we do so, we allow, as we allow ourselves to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, by allowing Christ to dwell in our hearts by faith, being rooted and grounded in his love for us and our love for him, and being filled with all the fullness of God, that being so, now we have the assurance that God is able to do for us exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. You see, we can't just live how we want and take out verse 20 and walk about and say, he's he can do exceeding, and we always say exceedingly, eh? It's not here. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can. Ah. No. Look at the last line there. According. According. According to the power that worketh in us. What did Paul pray for from the very beginning? That we be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. That we be rooted and grounded in love. So that we would be able to comprehend the length and breadth and height of his love. And to know the love of Christ which passeth all knowledge. And be filled with all the fullness of God. Now! <laughs> now! He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or even think. In effect. God will do for you and me not only more than we ask and desire in prayer, but, even, but also even more than our imagination can perceive. But we must understand that this promise is dependent upon the degree of the Holy Spirit's presence and the power and grace operating in our lives. We are the one to allow this, not by just attending church, hearing the word of God, and going out the same way we came in. 
No, this is why we are always preaching about the application of our word, of the word to our lives, so that the word can bring change as we apply it, as we apply the word. Change will come. With the change will come transformation and a renewing of the mind. And then we will know what is God's perfect will for us. Hello. So let us therefore allow Paul's prayer, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to take effect in our lives as we continue on in praying the said prayer every day, allowing the Holy Spirit to so work in our lives. What we will be praying for is the prayer of exceeding abundance. And it's not just in cars and things. And so it is in the power operating within us. Exceeding above, above all that we can ask or even think. God bless you. Let's stand.
who takes away our sins. The question is, has he taken away your sin? You see, this is the whole problem with the religious world today. The side of the religious world that talks about Jesus' Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. Most of them are yet to have Jesus Christ take away their sin. Because they have a mental assent to the fact. But a mental assent to the fact that Jesus Christ came, lived, died, and rose again does not take away one's sin. If that was so, the devil wouldn't have any sins because the devil knows that Jesus Christ came, he died, and he rose again. One has to appropriate the fact to one's life. That is to say, you have to act upon what Jesus has done. He came. He lived. He paid the price for sin. And he rose again. Fact. Have you accepted that? and made him your savior. This is what makes the difference between religion, man's way of reaching God, and relationship with God. Have you accepted that fact and made him your savior and your Lord? He is savior and he is Lord. But is he your savior, your Lord? And that is what makes it a personal relationship with God. The only means by which when we leave these bodies, we go on to be with him. Only when we make him our savior and our Lord. And this is what Jesus meant when he told Nicodemus, except a man be born again of God's spirit, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. Sin is what separated man from God. Jesus Christ paid the price for sin. He is God's gift of eternal life. And if you have never received him as your savior and your lord you're still in your sin let's bow our heads father and pray this morning that if there will be any here this morning whom you love so dearly but yet are separated from you because of sin I pray that this morning, Lord, they would recognize your love for them. A love that passeth all understanding, all knowledge. And they would be in a willing, with a willing heart, be able to say, Lord Jesus, I have sinned. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and save me. If there is such a one here this morning, Lord, I pray that you would move even now by your spirit upon their hearts in spite of what their minds may be telling them, that you would override their mind and touch their hearts so that you can open your arms and embrace them as a son or a daughter of the living Christ. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, if you're here this morning, you have never had that experience. You have never made him your savior. You never confessed your sin and asked him to come into your heart. 
I'm giving you the opportunity. You know, I know that perhaps 98% of us, if not 100%, but just in the event that you are here and you have not had that experience, this is your time. God has an appointment with you. Just raise your hand right where you are. We will help you with a prayer. We will help you with a prayer. And that prayer, as you pray, God responds to that prayer and you experience the miracle in your life. Is there one this morning? Yes, I see that hand, ma'am. God bless you. Is there another? Is there another that will join with this lady? Is there another? Raise it high so that I can see. Is there another? If you raise your hand, you can put your hand down. God saw your hand. And he saw your heart as well. Is there another this morning? This is your opportunity to come into a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. No longer will you be talking about him. Now you get to know him. Is there another? For those of you who raised your hand, would you meet me down here, please? I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you're going to experience the miracle for your own self. Come, meet me down here. Okay, well, you introduced yourself to me already, Nadia. So, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be shutting ourselves in and talking to God who is going to answer and do what you ask him to do so long as you mean it in your heart, okay? I'm going to help you with a prayer. Make it your prayer to him. Forget about me. Make it your prayer to God. And the miracle will take place as you pray this prayer sincerely. Dear God in heaven, I come to you this morning as a sinner in need of a redeemer. I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ left heaven's glory, came to earth, and died for me. I believe with all my heart that Jesus rose from the dead and I now accept Jesus as my Savior. I confess Jesus as my Lord. Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Put your spirit in me and teach me to live for you. By faith, I receive you into my heart, Lord Jesus. And I thank you for saving me. Amen. And that's it. That's it. It has already happened. The miracle has taken place in you. You are not the same person that came in. You look the same way, but you are not the same way. You came in a sinner. Now you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are a saint of God. Now you know, you, all you have to do now is to learn how to live for him. And this is what we are here to do, to help you with that. Okay, let's pray. Precious God, I thank you for Nadia. You had an appointment with her this morning, Lord. And I thank you that she responded to your call. I pray that she would have the experience of your spirit bearing witness with her spirit that this morning she was born a daughter of God. I pray that she would open her heart, Lord, and so imbibe your word like a newborn babe desiring the sincere of your word milk of your word so that she can grow and develop into a woman of God. I thank you for her in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's sing this chorus. <laughs> <laughs> 